Welcome to the next part of the summer school. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Professor Ross Anderson, my good friend. Um, he is well known for his uh, engineering book and for many workshops and conferences that he initiated, for example, the first software encryption stand. So, the first software encryption workshop, FSE, that he started in 1993, and many, many other uh, contributions, papers, students, and so on, he is in Cambridge, and uh, he will speak about uh, inference control. Ross? Yes, hi Ellie. Um, remind me how I get screen sharing going with this. You have the screen share button. Switch to Zoom again and then you will find the screen share button. Right, can you see that? Yes. Okay. Um, are you getting that loud and clear? Yes. Okay. Um, well, um, many thanks, um, Ellie, Orr, and Susie, for inviting me to this summer school. Um, the topic i am um, been asked to speak on is inference control. And um, Vanessa's talk earlier this morning gave some very good examples of how inference control fails. So what I'm going to do is to try and provide a historical perspective because, you know, I've been interested in um, information security and cryptography for a number of years. And there are a number of issues here that have come through our community in a series of waves. Um, Here's a quote from Cory Doctorov. Anonymized data is one of those holy grails like healthy ice cream or selectively breakable crypto. And I think you'll understand having seen Vanessa's talk this morning that anonymizing stuff is actually rather hard. Now, um, I'm in the process of just finishing writing a third edition of my textbook on security engineering. And there's a whole chapter, chapter 11 on inference control, which I um, updated a few months ago, and this, together with the other chapters, is on my website for review. So if you're interested in this subject, then I suggest you go to my website and download it, because once I ship the um, book to Wiley in a few weeks' time, then all but seven chapters will vanish offline for three and a half years. So at the moment, this is freely available for download. So in order to summarize what's going on here, um, <clears throat> I'm going to describe um, the four waves of statistical disclosure control. In the early 1980s, we had the first work by pioneers such as Dorothy Denning and Torre Delinius, mostly around um, census data. Then in the mid-1990s, we hit applications such as medical records where the data are just too rich. And as we saw from Vanessa's talk um, this morning, um, anonymizing medical records is really hard, but policy people like to believe that it's possible, and they are perpetually in denial about the difficulty of doing it at all properly. Now, the third wave arrives around about the mid-2000s, because then um, we had search engines, and we had large um, public data sets such as movie preferences, and what people found is that if you get hold of movie preferences or search engine logs, then it was relatively easy to identify individuals. And the response from the policy front was continuing denial, although some um, uh, policy people, such as those in Canada, called for more research in privacy-enhancing technologies. And researchers at, um, in, in Israel and also at Microsoft um, 
answer this challenge and along came differential privacy. And many people, particularly on the policy front, started um, claiming that um, um, differential privacy would solve all problems. And in fact, when you look at it in detail and how it works in the real world, um, it actually confirms um, in some detail the things that had already been worked out by Dorothy and Tora um, 25 years previously, namely that doing anonymity is really hard unless you've got a very well constrained problem um, about which you know an awful lot about the semantics and about the questions that are going to be asked. The fourth wave um, over the last few years is around social media location histories and genomics. Um, Vanessa already talked a little bit about um, location in the context of transport tickets. But there's so much more which continues to widen the gap between policy and reality. And this leads to, us to a number of implications from uh, GDPR through operational security and how that affects um, individual privacy um, and um, ethics, which has got a, 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 an effect on research. Now, as this is a two hour slot, what I'm probably going to do is um, call a break for uh, people to have um, comfort and tea and coffee and so on, perhaps after the um, first um, four of those sections, but let's see how we get on. So statistical disclosure control starts off in our field um, just before 1980 when Dorothy Denning uh, was working at the US Census and she bet her boss that she could work out his salary. Um, from the um, data that were made available. And he said, no, that's not possible. I mean, this is how we've been doing things since the 1920s. Of course, it's secure. Uh, so he, uh, she went ahead and worked out his salary. The mechanisms for doing that we'll discuss later. Um, but before 1980, the US Census had basically published its results in paper books. So you got got um, um, overall figures of number of people in particular states and congressional districts and so on. You had essentially population and income uh, per ward, plus one record out of a thousand which had identifiers removed manually, um, which people could um, look at if they wanted to do more detailed uh, sociological analysis. Now, what was happening in 1980 was that they were moving to an online database system, and that changed the game. And so people were trying to figure out what on earth can you do um, to stop people um, doing inference attacks um, if a bad person can simply go into the census database and make one query after another after another. And there are a number of naive approaches you can take. Um, for example, the um, medical records research system in New Zealand has a rule that they won't answer any query unless it's answered from at least six records. And this is the sort of rule that people were playing with um, as early as the um, beginnings of the 1980s. And the problem with that is that you get tracker attacks. So back when I wrote the first edition of my book in 2001, um, we had seven full professors of computer science at Cambridge, of whom um, one, Karen Spark jones was a woman. And the university had started um, giving pay rises to professors who had um, done well rather than just keeping everybody on a single scale. And so professorial salary started to be confidential. So <clears throat> what sort of information can you make public? Well, people wanted to know what the average salary of professors was in particular departments and schools so that they could um, um, try and figure out if economics professors were being paid more than poetry professors, for example. But if you allow any query to be responded to, um, if it's based on at least six records, then you can put in a query saying average salary professors in um, the computer laboratory and average salary male professors in the computer laboratory. And um, from these figures, you can work out Karen's salary. Or even you could ask these figures for all non-professors, in which case the numbers are very much larger. Uh, but, you know, the complement ends up giving you the same information. And what Dorothy Denning and a couple of colleagues did back in 1982 is to prove that on realistic assumptions, trackers exist for almost all sensitive statistics. And just to get a bit of um, terminology here, 
a characteristic formula um, selects a query set such as all professors and the smallest query sets are cells. A characteristic formula is something in the query language of your database. And then if the set of disclosed statistics is D and the set of sensitive statistics is P, then you need D being um, included in uh, the complement of P for privacy. And if D and the complement of P are equal, then the privacy is exact. And the early results um, by um, Denning and colleagues was that if the minimum query size set is less than big N over four, where big N is the total number of statistics, then general trackers are easy to find. How this works out in practice, of course, we've seen many times since. But that's not all. Um, suppose you've got policy which says that you should um, publish average exam results for people studying different subjects in your university, but you can't reveal exam results for individuals for data protection reasons. So this means that you can't reveal exam results for two or fewer students, because if you see here, uh, the students, um, only two students are doing a geology major and a chemistry minor. And so if you publish the average of their exam results, then either of these students can work out the score of the other one. So you have to suppress that cell. But of course, if you suppress just one cell and you make the totals available for the rows and columns, then that suppressed value can easily be um, worked out. And so what you end up having to do is complementary cell suppression. And this is one of Toro de Linnaeus's many ideas. And the sort of thing that you could do here um, is to decide that, well, um, since we're going to blank chemistry with geology, um, let's um, blank something else in, phys in, in chemistry, let's say chemistry and physics, and then you have to blank, blank physics and geology. And then you have actually managed to suppress the information uh, of, of the um, average mark of the two students who did geology with chemistry. But um, if you have any mathematical intuition, you'll immediately see that complementary cell suppression is expensive because if you've got n-dimensional data, then each primary suppression means that you have to suppress two to the power n cells. So what else can you do? Well, one of the things that you can do is query auditing. You simply have a list of all the queries that anybody's made. And once they get to the point that they could deduce the sensitive statistics, you say, enough already. Um, you've used this database enough, your user ID is cancelled, goodbye. Now, the problem with that is that it's, it's hard to do. It's an NP complete problem, as you might expect. Um, it also uses up your privacy budget and you end up with users being able to collude. So you can't have a separate private budget, privacy budget for each of a thousand different users. So that's impractical in almost all circumstances. The second thing you've got to worry about is outliers. Now, when I first started engaging with this uh, topic, it was in 1995 in the medical context. And back then, there was a single patient with HIV in the whole of Chichester. And one of the medics that I was working with at the BMA happened to be a GP for Ch Chichester, so he, he knew this. And how we ended up doing it in the British National Health Service is that statistics um, for common complaints such as asthma um, are made available by uh, medical practice. And um, for some less common procedures, they're made available regionally. And for really uncommon procedures, such as liver transplants, they're made available only on a national basis. So designing a system to mitigate you know, obvious privacy leaks um, is not straightforward. And we'll, we'll come to the complexities of medicine later. Another thing that you can do is random sampling, where you answer each query with respect to a subset of records, which are maybe chosen by hashing the query with a secret key. And this means that your results can be repeatable, so long as the database is static, and that's another problem we'll come to later. Um, but you can't then do intersection attacks um, at all easily um, across uh, rows and columns of the database. Another thing that people do is swapping and this was started by the Australian census people in the 1990s. And the idea um, is uh, that you uh, take some records, 
So if, for example, you've got a, a household with two adults and two children in a four bedroom house in Bedfordshire, for example, you might swap that with one in Cambridgeshire. And at the level that this is usually done in census bureaus, it's a large minority that gets swapped, maybe um, 5%, 10%, 30% when they're making up the microdata. Um, but you can't swap most of the records or you lose the value of the census. And so all you're really getting from swapping is plausible deniability. Um, it, it, it would make it difficult if census data were leaked to use it as evidence in a criminal trial. And perhaps you may have laws in any case that prevent the police getting access to it for investigatory purposes. And the other thing that people started doing back in the 1980s is looking at perturbation. How do you go about adding random noise? And that was later um, formalized in the theory of differential privacy, which we'll come to later. And um, one of the inventors will be talking in this um, school on uh, Wednesday, so you can get all the details from him. So I got involved in this in 1995 when I started being an advisor to the British Medical Association on the safety and privacy of clinical um, information systems. And one of the um, things that prompted um, a confrontation between medics and the UK government, the government of John Major at the time, is that his health secretary, Stephen Dorrell, wanted to start a research database of all hospital treatments in the UK. And the idea, um, as with the uh, Australian system that Vanessa talked about, is that you dig out information from the records of hospital payments, and each of these records would then have um, a patient name and address, a physician ID, um, uh, cost, diagnosis, treatment procedure, and so on and so forth. And the proposal was to de-identify um, the records by removing the names and the postcodes of the patients, but leaving uh, their dates of birth and uh, sorry, removing names and addresses of, pa of patients, but leaving the postcodes and the dates of birth. And um, it turns out that postcodes plus date of birth identifies 98% of people in Britain. And the people who escape um, tend to be people who, where you have got large numbers of um, young people living at the same address, um, universities, prisons, and army barracks. Um, everybody else is pretty well identifiable from um, postcode plus date of birth, with the exception of um, some twins living at home. There were other things wrong with the government's proposal as well, and the government set up um, uh, a committee under Dame Fiona Caldicott which studied um, healthcare IT privacy, and it found many illegal data flows in the health service. In 1997, um, Tony Blair got elected and his new government was keen to press ahead with putting more money into the health service and modernizing it, and they didn't have the patience to worry about things like privacy. And in fact, the Blair government didn't really care very much for privacy at all. It, brought in all sorts of other privacy invasive computer systems. So they just basically passed a law to legalize the illegal data flows and the hospital episode statistics system started running in 1998. So the problems that inference control in medicine are significantly greater um, than in a um, uh, national census. In a census, you might have something like um, 44 bits of information about an individual and since 33 bits are um, enough to identify a human and um, perhaps 28 bits are enough to um, identify an American you know there's uh, a problem but it's a problem that is kind of tract tractable uh, but in medical databases you've got an awful lot of context and here's an example Show me all 34-year-old women with nine-year-old daughters where both mother and daughter have psoriasis. Um, this, was, this was our MP in Cambridge at the time. And um, if you're allowed to make a query like this, um, then you can um, pretty well instantly pull out one person or one family from the whole population. Now, if you can link episodes into longitudinal records, 
then you can identify almost everybody, as Vanessa was uh, describing. And if you add demographic and family data, it's worse still. So if you've got a link between um, parents and daughters, but you do actually need that data for some kinds of research. Active attacks are worse still. If you've got a static database, it's hard enough. But if you've got a database where um, you can see as new records are being added, um, then of course that opens up a whole lot of new attacks. And if you, you add social network stuff, such as friends or disease contacts, that's worse still. And I believe we're going to be having talks later about COVID uh, contact tracing. So basically the only way that you can stay ethical, um, other than in very, very restricted uh, medical applications is uh, by getting patient consent. And at the minimum, that means giving a, a, a real opt out that works and uh, that patients have a chance to consider and which doesn't penalize them if they use it. So what about the, so what are the limits of this? Well, the UK case law was established by a case um, uh, called the Source Informatics case. And the idea here was sanitizing prescribing data. Now this was put together by a company then called Source Informatics, although it's been taken over several times since then. And the idea was that the company wanted to collect data on which doctor was prescribing which drug. Um, so that they could sell this information to drug companies who wanted to use it to calculate how much commission to pay their sales executives. And so their initial design had something like this, that for every week of the year, they would have a table for each doctor. So doctor one is prescribing a particular tranquilizer, for example, to 17 patients in week one and 21 patients in week two and so on and so forth. And the idea is that in a particular town, there might be 20 doctors in um, a brick, as they would call it. And the information um, on all of these would be given to the drug company. And the drug company could then see whether the sales person was effective at increasing the sales of that tranquilizer. Um, but when you look at this, you see instantly that doctor two um, is not there for all or for most of week three. And if these happen to be um, three of the 20 doctors in Bury St. Edmunds, for example, then the drug company rep for that time would say, aha, Dr. Two is, is, is obviously Susan Smith because she went skiing in the third week of February. So as we work through all the cases of possible side information that was available um, in, in, in this system, we had to add new uh, countermeasures. And in the case of um, this uh, temporal sensitivity of subscribing, we brought in perturbation so that the um, values for particular weeks were moved backwards or forwards um, with a standard deviation of about five weeks so that you were able to pick out long-term trends in prescribing, uh, but not um, individual behavior. And eventually, uh, this was tested in the High Court in London, and the court agreed that it was sufficiently um, anonymous that the information could be collected without getting consent of the patients. Curiously enough, um, something like uh, 20 years later, a second system for the same purpose was produced, and this then had the feature that if you had access to information from both of the systems, then information could leak. So, um, again, this is an issue of an example of composability and security in that if you um, try to put together two secure systems, the result can be an insecure system for reasons that you um, don't particularly um, um, anticipate. The same happened in a number of other countries round about then, round in the late 1990s, because this was a time when everybody was pushing for big, supposedly anonymized databases of medical research. And in um, Iceland, there was a startup called Decode, um, offered the health service free IT systems in return for access uh, to records for research. And this was all paid for by the Swiss drug company Roach. And the idea is that records would be de-identified by encrypting the social security number of each patient, but would be linked to genetic and family data and run live. And one of the things that we pointed out with this was that what they proposed to do is that whenever anybody wrote a drug prescription, the electronic version of that would go to the Icelandic Data Protection Commissioner's office, where there would be a PC with a hardware security module, which would remove the name and address 
um, of the patient and replace it with an encrypted version of the social security number. The problem with this is that if I want to find out, for example, the um, medical record of the then Prime Minister, David Odson, who was the advocate for this uh, thing because his school friend, Carrie Stephenson, was the guy who owned the company Decode, then all you have to do is to find one member of the Icelandic healthcare system, one doctor or one nurse, who then creates, um, say, a prescription for aspirin for the Prime Minister. And if you can look at the database before and after that prescription is added, you immediately see the in encrypted um, social security number of the Prime Minister. And then you can search backwards and forwards through the database for all the rest of his records. So um, this created a public row and the Icelandic Medical Association persuaded 11% of the citizens to opt out. And eventually the Icelandic Supreme Court ruled that the system should be opt-in and the uh, business collapsed. Other countries, Australia, you've heard about from uh, Vanessa. In Germany, after 1989, they found that the invaluable cancer registries from the former East Germany, whose records were fully identifiable and thus illegal under German privacy law. So they had to work um, quickly to put together a, a system of de-identification for this data for researchers. In both the Netherlands and Austria, there were projects for central electronic records led to medical privacy activism. And in America, Latanya Sweeney at Harvard identified the records of the Massachusetts governor, William Weld, from the database of supposedly anonymous um, records uh, that was made available by the Veterans Administration. And partly as a result of this, and partly as a result of other policy concerns, the Clinton government pushed through the, the Health Information Privacy and Accountability Act, HIPAA, which provides a fairly low baseline of health privacy, uh, but in the USA an awful lot of information security expenditure is uh, driven by compliance, and it's HIPAA compliance uh, that drives it in the healthcare sector, which is about 15% of the US economy. So if you're in the information security business, HIPAA for all its faults actually matters. In the UK, Prime Minister Blair ordered a national programme for IT in the NHS starting in 2002. And the idea was to replace all IT systems with standard ones with a single electronic health record with access for everyone with a need to know. And as you can imagine, that was a disaster waiting to happen because who decides need to know? Well, it's administrators in the centre and they decide they're going to need to know everything. And this became the biggest public sector IT disaster in British history with 11 billion pounds wasted and years of progress lost and lawsuits and flagship software didn't work. And this was finally supposedly killed in 2010 when David Cameron took power. But of course, many of those legacy systems are still there because they're in long contracts and they still have to be maintained. And it's, it's generally been a, a national headache. What happened in Europe um, is that there was a landmark decision of the European Court of Human Rights, IV Finland. Ms. I was a nurse in Helsinki and she was HIV positive. And our hospital systems let all the clinicians, all the doctors and nurses see all the patients' records. And so our colleagues noticed that she was HIV positive and basically hounded her out of her job. So she sued for compensation um, on the grounds that the hospital should have maintained her uh, privacy. And the Finnish courts refused, so she went to Strasbourg and Strasbourg overruled them in a decision in 2010. And since then, we all have the rights to restrict our personal health information to the clinicians who are caring for us. Um, in Britain, this right unfortunately expires um, in December when the transition period of Brexit um, uh, finishes. But um, for, for, for the rest of Europe, um, it is now the case that you can demand that your personal health information be restricted to the doctors and nurses involved in your direct care. And this means that all research systems that uh, draw on medical records must allow an effective opt-out, which must be respected. Um, that's the law. So what sort of secondary uses are there of medical data? Well, it's primarily cost control and then clinical audit. Uh, from the administrative point of view, and these are then justified by saying all these records would be useful in research. Uh, but very often research is a kind of afterthought that is used to justify access for management purposes. 
Um, and there are differing approaches. In America, you've got well-scrubbed incident data for open uses and lightly scrubbed data for controlled uses under HIPAA. In Denmark and New Zealand, there's lightly scrubbed data kept centrally, but with strict usage control. So in New Zealand, there's only um, half a dozen people allowed to um, access the uh, medical records database, and they, they basically have to go into a skiff, uh, basically a shielded room, uh, sit down at the terminals, um, make their queries, and come out with the results of their statistical queries noted down in a piece of paper. Germany is the toughest, which has got no central collection, and that's something that research medics in Germany complain about. And in the UK, as I mentioned, the hospital episode statistics database has got summary data with postcode and date of birth. And the UK approach we pointed out for years was contrary to law because people who tried to opt out were ignored. Um, nobody bothered to write the software which would respect opt outs. And um, people who tried to um, exercise an opt out well, in the case of one particular uh, protester, she was actually removed from the NHS's books because it's the only way they could um, satisfy that and keep the systems going. So, does anonymization work? Well, um, here's the example that we used in the UK. If you want to um, find out Tony Blair's medical record, you Google him uh, or look at him on your favorite other web search engine and you find that he was treated for an irregular heartbeat in Hammersmith Hospital on the 19th of October 2003 and on the 1st of October 2004. So you go to the HES database and you look up the code for atrial fibrillation on these two particular dates and you've got him. Now, um, if you stop linking up the hospital episodes so that this attack doesn't work, um, then you can't do serious research with it. So what's the solution? Well, the political solution has been to ignore the um, whole um, problem. Uh, Margaret Thatcher's view of data protection was that it was a German idea like ID cards, and um, therefore um, you would do as little of it as you absolutely had to in order to remain uh, compliant with Europe. And the Data Protection Act of uh, 1984 basically put the um, Information Commissioner's Office um, in darkest Cheshire, starved it of funds, uh, didn't give it significant enforcement powers and didn't let it hire any technical people. When data protection law was updated by Tony Blair in 1998, following a European uh, directive, the uh, transposition of that directive into UK law deliberately left about 20 loopholes, including a huge big loophole for data that the data controller could complain, could, could claim uh, was anonymous. The information commissioner, as the regulator was called after that time, um, has got a huge conflict of interest because the information commissioner is on the one hand the advisor on privacy to government departments and on the other hand the enforcer of the privacy law. So when a government department builds a system, they go to the information commissioner and they say, please advise us on privacy. And the information commissioner says, please make sure all your passwords are eight characters long and contain a non-letter. And the, gov the government department says, thank you. And then somebody annoying like Vanessa or me comes along and says, but this doesn't protect privacy at all. The information commissioner then has a difficulty going to the department because he signed off on the design of that system. There's a further problem in that the um, Caldicott Committee said that the responsibility for privacy in each healthcare organization should rest with someone called a, a Caldicott guardian. And this is typically um, a senior nurse, someone to whom patients can go and complain, and she'll give them a sympathetic shoulder to cry on. However, the decisions about what gets done with data in terms of the design of systems is taken by a department of people in London under the Secretary of State. So this is a standard security economics failure that the Secretary of State guards the system, but the Caldicott Guardian gets blamed when it goes wrong and somebody's data leaks. In 2007, after people started complaining about this, there was a review done by Richard Thomas, the then Information Commissioner, and Mark Walport, who was the Chief Executive of the Wellcome Trust, the biggest funder of medical research. And they basically came to the view that um, 
Um, everybody in the UK should make their data available for medical research because that was a, a social good. And they were not interested in um, listening to arguments that de-identification didn't work. We tried. Um, Doa Korf of FIPRA and I visited the two of them as they were doing this report and they just didn't want to know. So why is it that technical people get no traction with policy people? Well, um, Paul Ohm, who's a law professor in uh, Colorado, wrote a, an influential paper on this in 2009, Broken Promises of Privacy. And there he pointed out that for 30 years or so, computer scientists have known that anonymization doesn't work, but policy people just stop their ears and don't want to listen to this. And uh, Paul wrote this in a law journal, in a law journal style with lots of legal footnotes. And so that began to get a small amount of traction among privacy lawyers. 2010 saw the election of David Cameron as prime minister in a coalition government with Nick Clegg of the Liberal Democrats. And colleagues and I had helped to contribute to the um, privacy policies of the Liberal Democrats. And we managed to get a couple of egregious databases on, um, on, on children um, abolished with some effort. But at the same time, David Cameron had promised that if elected, he would bring transparency into government. This was in response to a demand from Tim Berners-Lee that um, government map data be made available for open mapping purposes. But the Ordnance Survey resisted that because it would undermine its business model. And instead, David Cameron hired this chap, Tim Kelsey, who had previously run a health IT company to be, in effect, the government's transparency czar. And Kelsey became also, in effect, the chief information officer of our National Health Service. And his vision for transparency was not to make map data transparency, but to make us transparent, because his idea was to sell all of Britain's medical records to all his friends in the pharmaceutical industry. So in 2011, David Cameron announced a policy that anonymized data would be made available to researchers, both academic and commercial, but with an opt-out. And in July 2013, the opt-out was removed, making the whole thing um, completely illegal. And in any case, our health services opt-outs have the wrong defaults and obscure mechanisms that get changed whenever too many people learn to use them. In this respect, they're just like Facebook's um, opt-out mechanisms, the mechanisms that give you some appearance of privacy from advertisers, but don't really. In April 2014, the scandal broke. It turned out that the HES data had been sold to 1,200 universities and firms in others since 2013, in other words, illegally, and lots of other bad things had happened. This was not just to non-profit researchers such as uh, universities, but uh, for-profit firms, including for-profit firms in countries that pay no respect whatsoever to privacy, such as Chinese drug companies. And by now, the HES database was 22 gigabytes with 1 billion Finnish consultant episodes since 1998. So everybody who had been in a British hospital as an inpatient or an outpatient or who had a test done, the results were basically um, spread um, all over the universe. And um, one of the big four consultancy firms even put the whole lot in a um, database with Google because it was too big to go in Excel and made it available to all its customers. And as it turns out, in Britain, we've got laws which say that if you want to take NHS data overseas, there's all sorts of hoops you've got to jump through. And it had not occurred to this big four consultancy firm that um, Mr. Google doesn't actually have any data centers in Britain. So they were breaking the law. So we saw the usual damage limitation, you know, some um, worthy um, people who wanted knighthoods or peerages were appointed to a committee to look into it and make the usual noises about lessons have been learned, blah, 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 blah. Um, but that was um, merely um, one of the significant scandals that affected this in the UK. So that's the second wave. What about the third wave? Well, um, the third wave starts in the mid um, 2000s. And it's about what happens when you've got data at planetary scale rather than just rich data. And the thing that got this um, in, in the headline news was when AOL released 20 million um, records of searches 
which had been made over three months by 657,000 people. And people got looking and very quickly they started to identify some of the authors of these searches. Uh, and this is Thel Thelma Arnold of Lilburn, Georgia, who was interviewed by the New York Times. She had made a number of searches um, around Lilburn, which enabled the town to be found. And she'd made a number of searches and other people called Arnold, her family members. Uh, and so it was fairly easy to find her. Um, and um, she'd uh, made searches about a dog that urinates constantly. And this is the dog that urinated constantly. And she was looking for advice. And, um, what she could do about that. So AOL fired its chief technical officer and the staff involved. Um, the, um, the talk by Vanessa talked about the Netflix case. This is where Netflix published anonymized ratings of 500,000 customers and basically offered a million dollars for a better recommender system. And Arvin Narayanan and Vitaly Shmyatikov showed that many subscribers could be re-identified um, against uh, public preferences, which they had listed in the Internet Movie Database. And the key insight here is the long tail, because there's about 100 movies that everybody watches. But apart from that, people's preferences are pretty unique. And so if you disregard the common choices, the uncommon choices uh, give the game away. And this is a little bit like the software that people use to detect um, undergraduates doing plagiarism in exams. In, in that you just disregard all the most um, common words and you look for the very uncommon words. And um, if um, a rare word is used in, in two different essays, you then flag that up and um, run further comparison. And it's a very efficient way of uh, finding and um, um, picking up matches. And again, the policy response to this is, guys, you should try harder. And regulators, particularly in Canada, um, rather than simply um, stopping such firms doing business in Canada, they said, let's have more research into privacy enhancing technologies or pets. And during the, the mid 2000s, this became a theme. And um, along comes differential privacy. Now, Kobe Nissim and Irit Dinner had already looked at ways in which you could reconstruct a database by linear algebra from random queries. In other words, rather than trying to work out very clever general purpose uh, trackers, you just um, rec uh, look to see whether you can um, make more queries of the database uh, than it's got data in it and use Gaussian elimination to, to reconstruct it. The problem then is that there might be some noise in the database, which might be naturally occurring, or there might have been some perturbations that have been added for privacy. And um, so to what extent does the number of queries grow? And they showed that if the noise is small enough, you don't need too many more of them. So the, if you're going to def defend a database against which lots of queries will be made, you've got to add noise and you've got to add enough. And the question that this leaves open is, well, how much noise is enough? And the breakthrough paper, uh, which actually turned out at a theoretical crypto conference in 2006, uh, was by Cynthia Dwarf, Frank McSherry, Colby Nissim, and Adam Smith. And they showed how to analyze privacy systems that add noise to uh, prevent disclosure. And their key insight um, is that no individual's contribution to the, result, uh, the resulting query should make too much of a difference. So what you have to do is to calibrate the standard deviation of the noise according to the sensitivity of the data. Now, how can you actually do this? Well, here's the insight, and I'm just going to give a, a, a very brief overview of it because Kobe is going to be talking on Wednesday and you can ask him all the hard questions. So a privacy mechanism is called epsilon indistinguishable. If for all databases X and X prime that differ in a single row, the probability of getting any answer from X is within the factor of one plus epsilon of getting it from um, X uh, prime. In other words, you bound the logarithm of the ratios. Uh, and what the differential privacy um, authors uh, noticed is that if you've got noise of the Laplacian distribution, then this gives indistinguishability with noisy sums because things compose and become mathematically tractable. And I, as I said, I'm going to leave the technical details of, of that for Kobe to discuss. 
because if you start getting into the math, you can get into quite a lot of it. And my, my purpose here is to give the overall picture of how this develops historically and its context in uh, policy and ethics. How does differential privacy work in practice? Well, those of us who um, have got some idea of, about maths realized very quickly that differential privacy is not uh, a magic pixie dust that will solve everybody's anonymization problem. And an issue that I had with people in Microsoft, um, which employed uh, Cynthia, was that their salesmen were going around saying that um, this wonderful new invention of ours, differential privacy, means that we can make your medical records database completely anonymous. And that is actually not the case at all. And we found in the UK that our health service calls for a new contractor to do database anonymization every year or two. And the firm that wins the contract is always the most ignorant because they overclaim the most. And then um, after a year or two, once they've um, read my book and um, Cynthia's paper and so on and so forth, they've got this old shit mo moment and they drop out and then another supplier comes along a couple of years after that. So what's differential privacy actually telling us? It says that we get a dependable measure of privacy when we want to answer specific questions where the number and where the type of questions is known very well in advance and we really understand the data. It's not an anonymous database that will answer any question. And the fascinating case study here, which is worth studying in detail if you're interested in this, is the uh, 2020 US Census. Now, the, the work here has been led by Simpson Garfinkel, who gave an absolutely splendid uh, keynote talk last year at PETS which is the basis of a description of this in my book chapter, but I would refer you um, to the original material, namely the um, publications that, um, um, that Simpson and his colleagues at the US Census Bureau have uh, made on the subject with the detail. So to start off with, they um, ran the Nissan dinner attack on the 2010 uh, census data. Now, the census edited file is the raw private data. That's the census returns, which have been edited to fill in missing data from other um, um, sources available to the government, like tax returns. And it's got 44 bits on each US resident. And um, Simpson and his colleagues found that they could reconstruct 38% uh, of this um, highly private database using the Nissan Dinner technique from the billions of bits in the microdata summaries that they had published. Now, it wasn't a trivial calculation. It took them a big server cluster of four months. Um, and of course, they had inside knowledge of how the whole thing works and how, how they were trying to do it. But it, it showed definitive, definitively that the old means of statistical disclosure control that we had relied on um, up until 2010 simply don't work, even in the context of something like a census, where you've got very, very structured data. You ask people um, you know, where they live, what their income is, how they travel to work, and so on. And the result of this was that only those uh, people who had been swapped were protected in the 2010 census. The 2020 census is trying to protect everybody. And this turns out to be a fascinating engineering challenge because when you start adding noise to numbers coming out of census tables, this means that the totals don't add up. But there are some totals have to add up by law, such as um, the state totals need to add up to the national totals because those are used to um, set congressional districts. And so they end up having to add the noise top down rather than bottom up. And this means that um, you get more noise in counties and more still in blocks, and you need special handling for edge cases like colleges and prisons. But the advantage of using a differential privacy approach here is that you no longer need to enumerate all the site information that an attacker might use. Another thing that's interesting to learn from the US Census case is that Simpson and his colleagues have built um, a simulator um, which enable you to um, look at what values of epsilon um, you can possibly select uh, and what the privacy trade-off is. Now, if you choose a large value of epsilon like a thousand, you just end up publishing everything. And if you choose a tiny value of epsilon, and then the data rapidly become useless. And the fact that you can simulate 
um, different values of epsilon and then look at what can conceivably be reconstructed at different levels suggests that the value of epsilon in this application might be somewhere between four and six. Uh, and that's a new insight because up until now, pretty well every research paper just starts off by saying, well, assume without loss of generality that epsilon equals one. Wrong, um, you know, you lose an awful lot of generality. And you have to get down to specifics here. So, where have we ended up with in legal terms? Well, um, Germany and France were unhappy with um, the UK and Ireland implementing the Data Protection Directive with many deliberate loopholes, including loopholes that allowed really sloppy anonymization. And so, we um, got the General Data Protection Regulation um, through the European Parliament in 2016, and it was the most heavily lobbied law ever, um, with over um, 3,000 amendments proposed in the Libe Committee. Does it work? Well, no, it doesn't, because there's no enforcement. Um, the um, Privacy Commissioner in Ireland, um, as a matter of national policy, won't enforce it against Google and Facebook because it has been Ireland's policy for 30 odd years to do absolutely everything they can to attract um, US companies to put their European headquarters in Ireland. So the Irish Privacy Commissioner had for years their office in a tiny little village in a nondescript town in the, in the middle of Ireland as a signal that no enforcement would be available. And even after GDPR came in and it made clear that behavioral advertising, for example, which is where Google and Facebook make their money from, uh, that's illegal. Um, the, the Irish Privacy Commissioner was doing nothing. So Max Schrems, um, a lawyer in uh, Vienna, has sued the Irish regulator, and we'll have to see how that works out. In the case of the UK Information Commissioner, she hides behind something called the UK Anonymization Network, because the way the law works in Britain is that regulators such as the ICO put out a code of practice and so she consulted on this and she, um, in fact, um, her predecessor consulted on this and he studiously ignored input from academics like us pointing out that his anonymization code was hopeless. And now that code um, has been enacted and people are um, relying on it, it's very difficult to see how um, enforcement um, can be done. So that's the state of play that we got to by the, um, the middle of the last decade, by 2015, 2016. And what's been happening since then? Well, the big changes since the second edition of my book came out in 2008 are location, um, thanks to smartphones, social networks, and machine learning. And the first two hold out the prospect of more data, and the third holds out the prospect of better analysis. Now, um, Vanessa already uh, mentioned um, a paper that came out in 2013 from Yves Alexandre de Montjoie, um, César Hidalgo, Michel Verlais, and, and Vincent Blondel, which showed that four mobile phone sightings are enough to identify someone. Um, there's a bit more to it than that. If you look at the Snowden revelations, which come out in the same year, Ed Snowden tells us about an NSA system called CoTraveler, um, which uh, basically looks at the um, mobile phone location history of all phones in the world from their cell site location history, and then tags as related those phones that travel together. And since this was inadvertently declassified by Ed Snowden, we've seen um, uh, evidence in a number of court cases in the UK of co-location analysis, as it's called in Britain. So if you use um, an anonymous crypto phone uh, when um, smuggling illegal immigrants in from Libya or dealing drugs or whatever, um, then what the police do is observe that you're using a phone whose um, IMC is from one of a range of data-only SIMs um, allocated to such uh, phones, and they then look for all other mobile phones that have been in the same um, cells uh, as the target phone. And usually what happens is that people are careless, and in addition to their crypto phone, they carry their ordinary iPhone that they use to talk to their wife and kids. And, th and then you know, right, um, 
phone number X is owned by, you know, Mr. Smith of 13 Acacia Avenue. So that has become an absolutely standard uh, police procedure that you find all over the place. Um, and you don't need a large number of um, sightings in order to pin two phones together with uh, enough evidential force for the police to be happy to collect that, uh, to present that in court. Private phone location data are also used in countries like America, where you've got bounty hunters, in that there are many firms which collect phone location data, um, for example, from um, apps in your phone. Next time you install an app on your um, Android phone in particular, or also on your iPhone, um, if it asks for access to GPS location, you better think twice, uh, because many of these apps are selling the location data to companies that then sell it on. Um, and if you've got an Android phone, then the location data will be available even when the app is backgrounded, which means it can track you all over the place. And there's um, a wonderful example of this um, in an article written by Stuart Thompson and Charlie Warzel in December last year. They bought a commercial data set of 50 billion pings from 12 million phones over several months in 2016 to 2017. And um, in an article in the New York Times, which has got some splendid graphics in it, they showed how you could follow a whole bunch of different people. So you could look at individuals, for example, on a demonstration um, in Washington, D.C. at the inauguration. And um, then instead of looking at um, a particular area at a specific time, you look at that particular um, phone ID um, over the whole three month period. Uh, and you then map out all the places that that person went to, including their home, their place of work, um, uh, sex clubs, you know, whatever embarrassing places they happen to have visited. And so um, Stuart and Charlie showed that you could follow home both cops and demonstrators from demos and find out where they lived. Um, they followed a singer at Trump's inauguration, and she was unable to tell which of the apps on her phone had betrayed her. They followed Secret Service uh, personnel who had been guarding the uh, president. They tracked visitors to the estates of celebrities. They tracked visitors to vice clubs. Uh, they even tracked down a Microsoft engineer um, who had worked uh, for, for most of um, one month at Microsoft, except for one visit uh, to Amazon site. Um, and then um, a month later, he started working at Amazon. And since they knew his home address, they went and knocked on his door and they said, hey, you know, do you realize that if Microsoft had been tracking your location, they could have um, figured out that you'd interviewed at um, Amazon on such and such a day. So this is uh, worth bringing to the attention of one's students because it, it really brings home the enormous power uh, of detailed fine grain location data. Um, as examples of better inference, um, a couple of my former students, Kumar Shahrad and George Denizis, did an exercise to try and re-identify traffic data. These are call data records um, from uh, a, a country in Africa whose phone company made them available for research in the belief that they were de-identified. And um, um, Shahrad basically showed that if you used an appropriate classifier, a random forest classifier, you could easily map um, together two similar uh, graphs. Uh, so the, the CDRs were um, identified by comparison with a social network graph, because what you're looking at then is the motifs, the little um, small patterns within graphs and how they relate together. Another example of better inference um, is the Cambridge Analytica scandal, because what happened then is that uh, one of our uh, postdocs, Michal Kosinski, figured out in, um, gosh, about two th 2013 or 14, that he could tell from four Facebook's likes whether you're straight or gay. And this got um, headlines in the news and a, a, a lecture at our psychology department, who's no longer with us, um, extended this work to the big five personality traits, to ethnicity and to political preferences. And he wrote a Facebook app that signed up 200,000 users for a free personality test. Not, that, not using the university, by the way, but with his personal trading company. And um, 
this gave him something like 50 million friends of these 200,000 users. Um, and he analyzed all their behavior um, on Facebook, which at that time you could see on Facebook. And he sold the data to the Brexit and Trump campaigns. And this was a clear breach of privacy law and election law and research ethics. Um, thank goodness this was done by his uh, private company rather than by him acting as a university teaching officer. Um, he has, of course, left the university as, as it, uh, using such data in uh, research was a breach of research ethics. And the whole thing, of course, became a huge political scandal, um, which um, caused great embarrassment to Facebook and caused its stock price to tank. And this has fed into current debates about the extent to which social media may have to be regulated very much more aggressively in the future. Another example of abuse um, happened when Google um, subsidiary, uh, DeepMind, this is the AI subsidiary that um, taught a data center to play Go. They also persuaded the Royal Free Hospital in London, which is um, uh, a, a, a big teaching hospital that specializes in transplants and stuff like that, uh, persuaded um, them to give them patient records saying that they uh, wanted to develop an app to diagnose acute kidney injury. And so the hospital just gave uh, Google DeepMind all 1.6 million records, rather than giving them those of the 60,000 relevant patients. Well, presumably they didn't know how to um, write a query to pull those records out, and it was easier just to give them the whole, the whole database. And when this came out, um, it turned out that this was um, decidedly illegal. Um, the ICO reprimanded the hospital, uh, but didn't force Google to destroy the data. Um, our ICO is very, very reluctant to move against anybody who might em employ expensive lawyers because they're terrified of being involved in a law case where the costs might run into millions and millions of pounds. And our political establishment showed its um, view of this um, incident um, because the medical director of the hospital who had given Google all these records got promoted and he's now a big wig in the UK's COVID response. So <clears throat> that's the background. And in the second part of my talk, um, I'm going to talk about an ethical response to this. Um, but I think that two hours is um, far too much for a single talk on, on Zoom. And so what I want to do now is to break, firstly to take questions in the first part of the talk, um, and then to have a tea break, and then I'll proceed to talk about ethics after that. So, Ali, I don't know if you want to open this to um, uh, talks, if, to, to questions, if people want to put their hands up. If you like. So, I don't see questions here yet. We just to have one, it's time. Otherwise, we have to invite our own questions. Well, my own usual question is, when I see all these things that happen all the time and again and again, and uh, people do all these errors again and again, is how come it's possible that people still do that? Well, um, why do people keep on breaking the law? Because um, you know, there's no incentive for them to change their behavior. Yeah. And this works at all layers in the stack. You know, it's, it's very, very difficult to teach anybody anything if their job depends on not understanding it. So you are very pessimistic, meaning there's nothing can, that we can do in order to make sure that it will not happen again? Well, after a number of years of... Um, campaigning and complaining about this, I was just getting um, burned out because if you keep on working on a, a topic and don't get a result, um, then that's dispiriting. And what happened, in fact, just before the uh, CareDot data scandal um, is that um, an NGO, Med Confidential, was started in the UK. And um, um, a couple of great guys there, Sam Smith and Phil Booth, set up this campaigning group 
and started to get, get deeply engaged um, in medical privacy issues. And Sam in particular is now engaged with the health service in seeing to it that the new systems that they build um, have got opt-outs that actually work. So if you want to make progress at something like this, it's a long slog. Um, it, it needs professional lobbying, it needs persistence, it needs funding, um, it needs motivation. Um, you know, one man against the machine doesn't hack it, particularly if you're just a part-timer. I don't see any other questions from the audience. When maybe somebody raised his hand. I don't see you raised your hand. Okay, good question. Uh, oh, two. Three. Oui. Uh, do you see them or should I read them? I can, I can see them. Differential privacy from the very beginning was oversold by Microsoft. How do we prevent our pets in general, not only differential privacy, being used to privacy wash harm, uh, harmful things? Well, you just have to look at this case by case, I think. Um, there will be discussion later on about um, privacy um, preserving contact tracing apps. And there there's a debate about whether it was actually a good thing to make, to try and make contact tracing acts privacy preserving in the first place. Because if what you want to do is to find people who are um, infectious uh, and um, enforce quarantine on them, then that is the antithesis of privacy. Um, how do you prevent technological um, innovations in general being oversold, well, that's hard because people who are doing a startup will hype it as hard as they possibly can. Um, how do you stop privacy enhancing technologies being used um, to hide harmful things? Well, you can't. Um, you know, um, mechanisms like PGP and Signal and so on are used um, not just by US officials who want to hide what they're doing from a, a, a malign and hostile president. Uh, they're also used by drug dealers and people smugglers and other bad people. And in fact, uh, Whit Diffie um, once remarked during the crypto wars back in the 1990s that if you stand up for privacy, you'll find yourself uh, uh, drinking in bad company at the wrong end of the bar. So um, in the second half of my talk, I'll come on to thinking about, you, you know, um, ethics and what these mean to security researchers. Um, Rakesh Mohanty says, is there any privacy breaker mechanism? I don't know precisely what you mean by that. Um, is, is there any particularly powerful attack? Um, well, the NISM um, um, uh, attack on um, using Gaussian elimination to reconstruct databases is one of these examples of a, a powerful general purpose attack. Um, Correlation attacks on mobile phone location data is another example. Um, Ecclesiastes, nothing new under the sun. Yep. There are questions in the Q&A. Uh, Itaia Nati asks, is it possible to differentiate between benign privacy breaches and serious ones? Um, is it possible to di di differentiate between benign breaches and serious ones? No, the, the difficulty that we found when doing this work with the BMA 25 years ago um, is that you don't know in advance what is going to be sensitive. Um, everybody assumed back in 1995 that the most sensitive thing would be HIV status. Um, but, um, you know, many gay men are increasingly out about their sexuality and a lot of people campaigned uh, vociferously uh, to get uh, more treatment for HIV and uh, better care for sufferers. Uh, but you could find people who... Um, are very, very embarrassed about medical complaints that other people might consider to be fairly trivial. And so you can't just easily classify stuff in advance. Um, 
Is there a standard privacy blocking mechanism before access by a user? Um, I don't understand that. Do, 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 do you want to spell that out, please? Um, is blockchain useful for PET? Um, well, blockchain isn't useful for anything except um, um, mon money laundering and uh, ransomware and um, uh, breaches of securities laws. I, I don't see any uh, useful of blockchain, use of blockchains for privacy. Um, and I do have a section on blockchains in the book as well, uh, in, 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 in case you're interested in that. And um, the, um, that's in the chapter on advanced cryptographic engineering. And the, the chapter on taking stock looks at um, the kind of um, operational security mechanisms you can use. Um, and this shows that the um, that OPSEC is enormously dependent on social context. And um, you really have to get into the, the details of the circumstance and um, um, how people um, interact with other people before you can um, come up with good answers to that. Um, standard privacy blocking mechanism before user accesses information or data. Well, that's typically just the access control that you have on a computer system, um, which on some systems may be a matter of file level access controls and others it's a matter of authenticating to a server. And again, I've got information on that in uh, the book. There's a chapter on access controls um, and there's another chapter on um, uh, cryptographic protocols. So what I'd like to suggest now is that we've got a tea break for five minutes. Um, because I, 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 uh, the, the, the remainder of my talk will only take half an hour and I think it's best to let people you know, go to the loo and make a cup of tea and uh, come back refreshed for the second part of the talk. Okay, tea for today and uh, we will keep the session open and when you are ready we will continue. Right, so we'll, so, 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 so we'll see you in 10 minutes. So... <laughs> The second part of the talk is um, how can you deal with this ethically? Now, given that my interest in this has been entangled for 25 years uh, with safety and privacy of systems in medicine, there's a cultural background um, that doctors have always realized that the law's boundaries are way too wide. And that if you do everything that you can't be jailed for or sued for, then you'll quickly lose patients' trust. So what's the ethical approach to medical practice and medical research in a world where you now have cloud-based health records and genomics? And five years ago, the uh, Nuffield Bioethics Council um, set up a project. This is a charity that was endowed by the... Um, the man who founded the Morris Motor Car Company. And um, it's got a small number of staff and does um, reports on various issues around uh, bioethics that come up from time to time. And um, this is the report that we produced four years ago, uh, the Nuffield Biodata Report. It's on what happens to medical ethics in a world of cloud-based health records and pervasive genomics. And there were 12 authors. We spent about a year on the project. And we would meet about once a month in London at the Nuffield's uh, premises. And I was the tech guy. And there was a, a lady who was a genomics researcher. And there was a, a professor of medicine who led a research team. And there was a guy from an insurance company uh, and, and, and so on. There were various stakeholders from you know, the, the world of healthcare. Slightly under half were uh, uh, medics, uh, several were ethicists, and there were others making up the team. And we chewed through these issues uh, at some length, and we swapped drafts backwards and forwards, and the report eventually came out um, with a number of suggestions. So here's basically the problem statement, summarizing what we've um, 
discussed in the first half of this talk and one or two other things as well. Um, first, there's cloud-based medical records. Until about 2003, all general practice records were kept in PCs in, in the surgery. And then the government, um, under the national program for IT that we mentioned, offered to pay for them. And um, as a result, um, the control passed from the doctors to the government. And after 2010, everything started moving to the cloud uh, because the national program for IT didn't work very well. And new suppliers came along, um, plus one of the old suppliers had pitched to the government, let's put in new cloud-based systems and we can make this all hunky-dory. Hospital systems, too, have been starting to move to the cloud. And this started with radiology as part of the NHS program for IT. And um, there were all sorts of teething problems from this. I mean, our, our own hospital in Cambridge had its accident and emergency uh, department unable to use x-rays uh, for a number of hours after there was a, uh, an explosion miles away in a chemical plant, which destroyed the uh, fiber optic link between the hospital and the uh, place where the um, radiology data was kept. But anyway, we've got over that now, more or less, and now most clinical information is on a few big server farms. And we see similar technology and policy trends elsewhere. It's just cheaper to keep stuff in the cloud than it is to have servers all over the place. You end up having to pay fewer sysadmins and the, the, the effort that you put in to things like backup and recovery can be centralized. So this creates much bigger targets. So there's lots more data. You, you, you've got cloud-based records. You've got genomics. There's now something like 100,000 patients in the UK have had their full DNA um, genome sequenced. Many of these are cancer patients, where they also go and sequence a number of cancer cells so that they can figure out the details of the cancer and the treatments that's like, that are likely to be effective against it. But the government's got a declared objective of sequencing most of the population sooner or later. Then you've got patient-generated stuff like the things that come from your Fitbit or that you collect off your mobile phone. And then you've got a vast amount of stuff like communications data, laboratory data, and those things that you can hoover up out of social media, as uh, was illustrated with the, um, um, the Cambridge Analytica problem. Um, you can even deduce people's health status um, or, or uh, um, psychological attributes from communications data, because, uh, for example, um, sociable and extroverted people tend, tend to make more calls to more people. And then you've got the capability to store and process this. And this has already led to all sorts of dumb initiatives. And we saw two examples that were actually illegal, selling a billion records for £2,000 each to 1,000 plus corporate users and giving over a million records to Google DeepMind. So how can you deal with this systematically in the future? Another problem is that in the old days, there was a clear distinction between operational and statistical users. And the former have access controls. You have a rule like a nurse can see the records of any patient who's been in their ward in the previous 90 days, while the latter had inference controls. Even if these were weak and consisted merely of removing names and addresses, they did buy you some value against um, less motivated attackers. But there's now a move to what's called personalized medicine, and it's breaking down the barriers. So it's the sort of thing that a firm like Google DeepMind doing is that direct care of research. And during the DeepMind scandal, it was difficult to get a straight answer from them on which it was, because they would sometimes say we're doing direct care and sometimes say we're doing research, depending on what their lawyers would think would be most advantageous at the time. And as we saw, anonymization has turned out to be a broken promise of privacy. <laughs> in Paul Ohm's words. Um, and in fact, um, when I was um, <clears throat> texting someone um, about anonymization, I think it was Vanessa, um, my iPhone auto-corrected anonymization to abomination. So um, from the point of view of uh, uh, many people who are concerned about privacy, anonymization is indeed an abomination, but it's with us and what can we do about it? So 
the standpoint that you take if you're doing an ethical analysis um, is um, a, a moral and ethical one rather than a technical one. And we have some discussion of this in the, in the report, that the distinction between public and private evolved over millennia, way before history. And in fact, there are some aspects of privacy behavior that we see um, in um, other primates, in chimpanzees, for example. Uh, chimpanzees are um, trying to mate with someone who's a mate of the dominant chimpanzee will be furtive about it, and so on and so forth. So this goes way, way, way back in evolutionary time. We also know that norms of disclosure are important for the formation and maintenance of identity and relationships. Uh, the ability to choose your support group and define who your friends are um, is tied up with the fact that you share some personal information with them. Um, one of the speakers earlier was talking about how in Israel people are um, easygoing talking about uh, things like marriage, but very touchy about talking about um, salary, for example, in different societies of different norms. There's then a particular angle of this in healthcare, which is that consent is how patient relationships work. And without it, treatment is assault. And in particular types of healthcare, for example, in um, um, talking cures by psychoanalysts and psychotherapists, um, consent is actually quite a thorny issue uh, because you end up with a relationship of dependence between the patient and the analyst. And so um, some care has to be taken around that. Now, there are public interests, such as public health and research, uh, but it's wrong to see these as simply in opposition to private interests and confidentiality. Because once you start looking at um, uh, real cases, the whole thing becomes very much more complex. So how do you deal with this? Well, there's law and governance. And laws reflect an emerging social consensus, but with a time lag and a big lobbying bias. And we discussed data protection law and the human rights law aspects through the Finland case. And the take that we usually had up till now, namely consent or anonymize, um, is becoming undermined everywhere. First, as we've seen, anonymization doesn't work. And also, consent is becoming steadily harder. If you speak to people who work at big service firms like Google and Facebook, for example, they describe that even with the best will in the world, it is ever more difficult to give people meaningful consent choices because a particular service that you get uh, from your Android phone, for example, may be based on dozens of different um, collections of data that were made over the years. And it's very, very hard to explain to people um, how checking some particular box in a consent form may have unpredictable consequences down the line. So, as we've already mentioned, regulators are captured and Parliament by and large doesn't care because parliamentarians listen much more to business lobbyists uh, because they have the resources to get much more um, access than, than privacy lobbyists do. Um, there's a friend of mine who works as a chief technical officer for the Blair government, uh, remarked in a different context, the context of open source software, that he had the devil's own job getting any open source software advocates into Whitehall to talk to ministers, because all the leading open source people were busy doing their research or running their companies. Whereas if he wanted to get a Microsoft person in to talk to um, ministers or officials, that was easy because Microsoft always had three or four lobbyists on call in London around Whitehall, you know, ready to immediately answer a phone call and go and talk to somebody. So the, there's a huge inequality of arms between the business lobbyists and everybody else. So in, in this circumstance, what should an ethical researcher do? Now, what we come up with um, were four principles which we elaborated and discussed in the medical context. The first is uh, the principle of respect for persons that the set of expectations about how data will be used in a data initiative should be grounded in the principle of respect for persons. That is, people have got a moral interest in controlling others' access to and disclosure of information relating to them held in circumstances they regard as confidential. Or um, spelling it out from the point of view of industry, you cannot use people's 
sensitive parcel information as industrial raw material. That's just the wrong way to approach it. Unfortunately, it's the way that the big um, data firms do approach it, uh, but it's, it's not consistent with our moral and ethical principles. Second, the set of expectations about how data will be used in a data initiative should be determined with regard to established human rights. Because human rights, as expressed in, for example, the European Convention on Human Rights in Europe, or the US Constitution in America, are a social consensus on the absolute minimum. You know, that you're not allowed to torture people and, and so on and so forth. There are absolute limitations on the power of states, um, and there are also relative limitations, and, and um, the, the privacy right is usually a relative limitation in that it can be overridden only um, where something is proportionate and it is necessary in accordance with the law. So um, states' powers are limited um, in the, their ability to interfere with the privacy of individual cit citizens um, unless a, a number of criteria are met. Now, of course, as an ethicist, you hope that you will do very much better than that, but that's the bare minimum. And it's just not acceptable, for example, to ignore the IV Finland uh, judgment um, if you're um, processing data of uh, residents of European Union or indeed Council of Europe countries. The principle of participation says that the set of expectations about how data will be used or reused in a data initiative and the appropriate measures and procedures for ensuring that those expectations are met should be determined with the participation of people with morally relevant interests. In other words, you should ask people what you're going to do, right? You can't have individual consent for some cases if, for example, there's a pandemic and suddenly you want to reuse um, mobile phone data, for example, to track people, but you've got to be very open and upfront and, and public about what you're doing. And you should go and um, not just tell the press, but you should do detailed consultation uh, with uh, people who might reasonably be seen to be representative. So, for example, when our government was making an attempt to develop a, a COVID contact tracing app, um, they first contacted all the um, NGOs with uh, privacy interests in the UK and got us into a consultative group, which was organised by the Ethics Committee of the Aaron Turing Institute. And once we'd given initial feedback, that, that was then widened when the um, existence of the app was made public on Easter Sunday and a uh, discussion was uh, fermented in the press. And the thing that you have to do here is to ensure that a full range of relevant interests and values are represented. And the failure mode here is that typical, typically when medics are doing medical research, they have this approved by a research ethics committee that's full of other doctors. Okay, and the usual deal is that um, I sit on your ethics committee and you sit on mine, and I approve your research and you approve my research. And as for the patients, well, we just... Um, assume that they'll be good with everything that we do. And that's wrong. Uh, that's, that, that's not the way in which these things should be done. And principle four is accounting for decisions. A data initiative should be subject to effective systems of governance and accountability that are themselves morally justified. And this has got a whole bunch of stuff around it, depending on the circumstances. Um, you should invoke leg legitimate judicial and political authorities and social accountability. And that means, for example, that you've got to have breached disclosure. Um, if governance fails, um, if control fails, if somebody leaves 8 million uh, medical records on a laptop on a train, you've got to actually tell people. And thanks to GDPR, the rules have more or less gone in that direction. Uh, but if you're going to act ethically, you shouldn't just be doing the, the minimum you should be doing the maximum. So how does this apply to security research? Well, after the Facebook app that led to the Cambridge Analytica scandal uh, became public, we started thinking about this because at the time we were running a system called Device Analyzer, which ran on 20,000 odd Androids. And the idea was that we collected um, information on who was running what apps for what purpose and what sort of communications that they were using. Um, were they using Wi-Fi? Were they using the mobile network? What version of software did they have? How often was it updated? 
and this gave some benefits for the user, the personal analytics in terms of the, the cheapest phone plan for them. And for us, it was about understanding smartphone use, energy consumption, um, cyber crime, what proportion of Androids in the fields were, uh, were updated and which were vulnerable to known zero day attacks and all sorts of other stuff. And so we decided that we would make this uh, completely open and we set up a website, uh, deviceanalyzer.co.uk if memory serves, um, where we linked all the research papers that had been written using this data, uh, plus all the information about the project itself. And we thought through, for example, what would happen um, if somebody sold their phone. Uh, we saw to it that we sent a notification every month to everybody who was still running Device Analyzer. And we used this as a cockpit for, if you like, debugging an ethical approach. Now, the guy who ran Device Analyzer, um, Daniel Thomas, has since left Cambridge and gone to the University of Strathclyde. Um, so this, this is now, if you like, a legacy thing, but it was an important training phase. And we then extended this to all our cybercrime work um, because an awful lot of this involves data that will never be open data for various reasons. And in that respect, um, doing research on cybercrime is a little bit like doing medical research. You've got to figure out how you can use data um, that cannot be made open. So how does this work? Well, up until 2015, cybercrime research wasn't a science because what would happen is that somebody would get hold of some data, um, typically by going and drinking beer with somebody from an antivirus company, and they would um, write a script and they would trawl through this data and they would come to some conclusions and they'd write the thesis and they'd write a paper and they'd go off and get a job with Facebook. And if somebody read the paper and said, aha, I think I could analyze this data better, then they were out of luck because the data was under NDA, it was old, it wasn't curated, and so on and so forth. And so to help fix this, we had the idea that we needed to set up a center um, that would um, collect and curate masses of data on malware, spam, fish, botnet, traffic, and so on and so forth. And so we set this up using data that we collect from our own sensors and we fortified it by getting inbound licensed agreements from various firms that we work with as, who give us things like spam feeds and with outgoing license agreements so that you can license data from us under a standard NDA which is acceptable to the firms which give us our incoming traffic in the first place. And this is um, licensed now to 100 plus researchers at 30 plus universities in Europe and elsewhere. Our most popular um, collection is what's called Crime BB. And this started off when the Mirai botnet um, came along in October uh, 2016. Uh, this, this is a botnet that ran on the Xiaomi CCTV cameras and used the fact that they had a default um, engineering password that couldn't be changed because the software couldn't be updated. So you can, uh, this is a wormable exploit and you can simply look for all CCTV cameras as they're powered up and you can grab some of them and use them for bad purposes. What then happened was that the authors of this particular um, worm uh, put the thing on hack forums and from there lots of other people created variants of the worm and so we said aha hack forums obviously bears looking at so um, what one of my postdocs Sergio Pastrana Portillo wrote a scraper which would solve the captures on hack forums and um, um, basically scrape all the data. Over, over time, we collected all the data going back 12 years. And we then went, went on and started scraping many other crime, underground crime forums in both English and Russian. And we now have tens of millions of messages uh, relating to cybercrime. And um, more recently, we've started a, a separate collection, Extreme BB, um, is a database of um, extremist material. Mostly it's um, alt-right um, related extremism, although we're also collecting stuff in, 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 in Russian and Chinese and we're thinking about doing some Arabic language collection. And the purpose of these databases is to enable researchers who are working not just in computer science, but also in law, criminology, psychology, politics, and so on, to look at what goes on. Let me give you an example. Um, a few months ago, uh, we were interested in um, attacks on mobile phone authentication, and we wanted to figure out what the relative prevalence of attacks using SS7 hacking is versus attacks that use SIM swapping. 
And so that's simply a matter of writing a few SQL queries and going through CrimeDB. And we could then see an enormous volume of chatter about SIM swapping and only a couple of threads about SS7 hacking. And what's more, we can see the history and the evolution of underground interest in SIM swapping. And we could track it back to people who were doing OG attacks on Instagram in America about four years ago. So this is the kind of thing that you can do with a, a database like this. It's very, very powerful. Um, it's, I think, the only database available to academics, which enables you to uh, practice the same kind of techniques that the intelligence agencies use um, you know, when they're hunting for interesting underground communities. Now, we don't go out of our way to collect explicitly sensitive stuff um, like credit card numbers, but still there's an awful lot of stuff in there that's disclosive. Just as the uh, lady I talked about earlier disclosed herself um, in AOL searches, so there are people in um, underground chat on crime forums dis disclose enough information to identify themselves. And we've got IP addresses and all sorts of other stuff. So this cannot be made um, publicly available. Um, and yet there's a strong public interest in such a repository being available. So our unique selling proposition is that you, if you've got data that you want smart people to look at, uh, then we can get it to academics who can use it. And if you want to do research on cybercrime, we've got an awful lot of data that you can use. So all the stuff that we do is approved by our ethics committee, and we insist that all our licensees also get ethics clearance uh, for all the research that they do. And ethics committees um, fix many of the legal problems that you would face if you're working with um, personal information. Because in the criminal law, um, in England at least, you have to have a wicked intent in Latin mens rea when you do a forbidden thing, actus reus. And if you've said in advance what you plan to do, um, then if you inadvertently commit a, a prohibited act, um, it's still extremely unlikely that they will be able to prosecute you. And if somebody's going to sue you for a tort, for example, of negligence or breach of confidence, then the yardstick for tort law is usually by the standards of the industry. So this is good for the researcher, but this is also a bad thing because ethics committees protect, are designed to protect the researcher, not the data subject. And there is, of course, a lot of hypocrisy about this because that ethics committees pretend that they're protecting you know, patients in hospitals and criminals underlying and so on when they're not really. Now, the dark side of um, this all is the wicked security economics. Um, which I discuss a bit in the book chapter, which is that people have got an incentive um, to um, basically be hypocritical about this. And so this is something about which one has to be um, cautious. Yet the reality of modern research is that there's going to be more and more research done on data which sits behind some kind of privacy wall and which can only be um, dealt with um, you know, by, the, um, by an ethical approach to private data. And an example, a really good example that's come up in the last couple of months um, is research done by an Oxford GP, Ben Goldecker, on COVID. You know, Google for open safety and you can find his paper in Nature. Uh, what he basically did uh, was to work with one of the three uh, companies that provide cloud-based GP records to medical practitioners in Britain, uh, which meant that he had direct access to um, something like 20 million patient records. And so he was able to look at all the COVID diagnosis and, um, uh, and, and all the COVID deaths, and he was able to work out for the first time good figures on what the increased risk from COVID is as a function of age, as a function of ethnicity, as a function of social deprivation, um, as a function of various pre-existing conditions. And work like this is clearly very strongly in the public interest. If you work directly with the data, you can get the results. And my own view is, for what it's worth, is that the future of research with big data is going to be doing the research behind um, some kind of privacy wall on a large collection. This, of course, raises other questions. It raises questions about access. Um, how many people have got access to a big cloud medical records provider. Uh, and of course, we tackle this in our own work 
uh, by taking the view that we're prepared to license it to any um, good faith researcher from a proper university where the researcher and the university are prepared to sign the relevant license and non-disclosure agreement. So <clears throat> this is, if you like, what the way forward is. Um, it's dealing with private data as private, even if it's only slightly private, and creating the right governance and standards around it so that you can do that uh, in, in a way that people aren't likely to object to. Future directions. Well, here's a saying from my thesis advisor, the late uh, Roger Needham. Privacy is a transient notion. It started when people stopped believing that God could see everything and stopped when governments realized there was a vacancy to be filled. Perhaps a, a, a slightly um, cynical view of it, but I, I, I think we've shown that there are some ways in which we can push back and there are some ways in which we can see to it that um, research can be done on the basis of private data, provided it's done ethically and provided it's done with the right controls. Uh, for more, um, there's a discussion in my book, not just of inference controls, but on safety and privacy in medicine and on various um, issues around um, um, AI and um, operational security. So there we are. Does anybody have any questions? Time to questions. So first of all, thank you very much for the first part of the talk, but most certainly for the second one. And trying to find exactly the ethics of how to work with such sensitive data is very important. How do you envision? The... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the question wasn't that good. Uh, how do you envision this working in, in a global environment of international research? Because privacy and regulations and the moral and the ethics are very different between what's done in England or the UK, the way it is done here in Israel. In other places, how, how do you see this sort of effort that you've done, I think, in a more UK-centric approach, uh, becoming more global? What are the well, well, it's going to be hard because there are some countries like China which will rest to the bottom and cheat. And um, we're just going to have to see how that works out. The, um, there are particular concerns um, over the... <laughs> the use of um, many AI techniques by the government of China in um, surveillance and control, which they're currently debugging, for example, among their Uyghur population. Um, that, that has the potential to be quite unpleasant. Um, I suppose the, um, again, a thing I d d discussed in my book um, is the fact that although modern machine learning techniques can be very good at perception, at finding particular patterns, whether human recognizing people's faces or recognizing patterns in ghost zones, um, they're very much less good at control and they're very bad indeed at social prediction because of the sheer complexity of human interactions. So um, hopefully um, the Chinese won't be able to create a completely authoritarian state that takes over the world. But it is, there is nonetheless a concern there. So what if we start with trying to only put it in countries which are, I would say, more aligned? If, if, if we would have had this conversation in the 80s, I would say the Western world was one huge pile. Again, taking into consideration there are local cultural changes, but still there was one democratic approach compared to the Soviet Union and allies. Well, the Soviet Union was uh, was always just an outsider and a bit of a loser. They've never produced anything other than uh, primary commodities and weapons. They, they never competed with us in, in terms of our broader industrial base. And when they did have things like computers, they were basically copies of Western stuff. Now, China is different because it's a full-spectrum competitor, 
and they're trying to build a full stack that will give them independence of everything from you know chip fab equipment through to um, everything else and although that may take them 10 or 15 years it means that we may end up um, with a new cold war between a, a west and an east uh, which are of um, comparable capability and um, the, the way that goes is, is anybody's guess. I mean, up until recently, people used to believe that once you passed the democratic threshold of a per capita GDP of about $5,000 or so, countries would become democratic automatically. And so everybody was kind of hoping that once China got there, then China would have some kind of revolution and, um, you know, as, as happened in Taiwan and Korea and so on, and, and, and you would end up um, having all... Um, sweetness and light, but that's clearly not happened. So. So we have a question by uh, Rakesh who's asking, is there any mathematical model to define privacy of a human being? I think, I think that's th that you're in a state of sin for even asking that question. Um, because if you, if you look at uh, chapter 25 of my book on the, and the section on operational security, I discussed the privacy requirements of a number of different people there, um, you know, from uh, ch children to dissidents to lawbreakers and so on, and what that actually means in their circumstances. And it is the absolute opposite of something that you can deal with using mathematics. It is intensely dependent on uh, social and political circumstances. And unless you understand these in depth, you can't reasonably hope to do anything useful. I would just mention that one of the works uh, probably missing has been doing in the last few years was an attempt to actually take one of the GDPR uh, requirements for privacy and formalizing them. And he has a wonderful, I'm not sure if he's going to talk about it during the summer school, but he showed that the legal definition included uh, had impossibility results coming with it. It cannot be achieved formally uh, if you put it in a different privacy framework. So I guess that there are several attempts at this, but... Uh... Well, I tend to, you know, it's, it's, it's useful if you can build mathematical models that do useful work. But I think it's a mistake to think that you can do everything with mathematics. Now, my first degree was in maths, and then I went and spent a dozen years building equipment for banks and utilities and so on. I went back and did a, a computer science PhD in my mid-30s, by which time I had some idea of what problems were important and which weren't. And by about 2000, it had begun to become clear to a number of us that simply designing more encryption algorithms and more security features for operating systems wasn't making the world a better place, because the internet kept on getting more and more insecure. And the penny finally dropped that many of the large-scale failures are due to failures of incentives. You know, if Alice guards a system and Bob pays the cost of failure, you're going to have trouble. And so um, I, I spent much of the 2000s helping to develop the economics of information security as a discipline. And um, it, over the last 10 years, we've been expanding that to psychology and criminology. Because once you start um, trying to do security of systems where the security isn't about technical complexity, you know, about making Kerberos work in a suitably scaled up distributed system. But it's about the underlying human complexity, you know, all the side knowledge, the covert channels, the, the ways that people have to break the rules in order to get their work done, then that becomes your limiting factor, right? And if you start staring at the mathematics, you're staring at an unimportant part of the problem. So from the point of view of security engineering in the real world, we're now dealing with something that really is a multidisciplinary thing. It's just like, if you want to qualify as a doctor, sure, you know some mathematics, you know basic statistics and pharmacokinetics, but you must also know anatomy, physiology, pharmacy, psychology, and then you must um, get the clinical experience of walking around the wards for several years and observing how experienced doctors behave. And then you must have the experience of a few years being a junior doctor under the supervision of a senior doctor. And only when you're about 35 or so do you get your consultancy and you can go off and operate independently. Now, security engineering in the future is going to be a similar thing. In order for somebody to um, understand 
security engineering well enough to be able to tackle a problem like designing a COVID tracing app. It's not enough to know the cryptography and the protocols. You've got to understand how the people are going to behave. What about the economics, the incentives? Why on earth should I run a COVID tracing app if all that's going to happen is that with probability, um, any notification that I get will be a false alarm, which causes me to have to self-isolate at home for 14 days, right? And, and, and people, actually, people are actually smart enough to figure that out. You know, they will, they will not install the COVID tracing app, or if they're forced to install it on a phone, they'll install it on a burner phone and leave it at home. You know, you, you have to be able to see all these angles of a problem. And an attempt to try and make something into a mathematical model so that you can bring it into your comfort zone and just stand up with a whiteboard and make symbols, that's not how you do security engineering. And it's not how you could do good research in cryptography or access control or anything else either. You've got to find interesting problems to work on, and that means interesting problems in the real world. Are there any more questions from the audience? Oh, you received a message. Okay, no, it appears that we, know, have, we don't have any more questions, so I would like to thank you very much once again. Thank you. Thank you, Was. <laughs> and we will take a break until another 15 minutes for the international uh, visitors not in Israeli time zone to hear Susan Nanda. Thank you very much, Ross. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you. Cheers.